Hello, I'm Phyllis Bennis from the Board of Jewish Voice for Peace, and I want to welcome you all to our discussion today about the situation in Palestine, the situation on the ground, the political moment, the region, the U.S. We're going to try and cover a bunch of stuff. I'm joined today by my dear friend uh, Nadia Hijab, who's in London, so it's a little late there. Nadia, it's not too late for you, I hope. No. And, good. And I'm going to sort of introduce myself and, and uh, then introduce Nadia, who's going to kick us off. Uh, and then I'll come back with a different part of our discussion uh, in a few minutes. So first of all, just to let you know who I am, uh, I'm on the board of JVP, as I mentioned. I've been working on Palestine issues for a very long time. I was with Nadia, a co-founder of what's now known as the U.S. Campaign for Palestinian Rights, what used to be the U.S. Campaign to End the Israeli Occupation. And I've done a lot of work uh, involved with the relationship between the U.N. and Palestine and have written and spoken a lot about the issue. Uh, Nadia is Palestinian. She's going to introduce herself from London, and she will start talking about the political moment in Palestine, uh, Palestine on the ground, a bit of U.S. policy, and then we'll go forward from there. Nadia. Great. Thank you very much, Phyllis, for that introduction. And let me uh, add that... Uh... Uh, well, I'm Nadia Hijab, and I'm the executive director of Al Shabaka, the Palestinian Policy Network, which I co founded uh, in 2009 and which was launched in 2010. And if you ha need any more background or have any more questions uh, about the kinds of things that Phyllis and I are going to be talking about, do check out the site at, uh, at al shabaka.org. Um, so I'll just kick off, as Phyllis said, with uh, uh, an attempt to, to summarize what's been happening uh, recently on the ground um, and how we should think about it and what we should do about it. It's really been a very, very fast moving and very fluid period in, in Palestine, Israel, and the overall Middle East in the last uh, few weeks, as in fact, it almost always is. But it's been especially difficult to keep up with the shifting alliances that we've been seeing. And I think for us as uh, uh, advocates of human rights uh, for Palestinians and for, for everyone, um, the key thing to remember that the core issues of the conflict remain constant and uh, as does our search for freedom from occupation, equality for the Palestinian citizens of Israel and justice for the refugees. So whatever is happening um, in that immediate moment, we need to keep those core issues in view. Obviously, um, we want to take advantage uh, of what's happening uh, politically at the, at the moment in order to position ourselves um, and I want to say um, that as far as I can see uh, from my vantage point, the U.S.-based movement for Palestinian rights has proven itself very adept in maintaining the focus on those core issues while positioning itself to turn threats into opportunities, such as the attack on the right uh, to free speech in the U.S. and the right to boycott, which I think Phyllis will uh, talk a little bit about later on. So what's the situation on the ground? We've all been following, I'm sure, the upheaval of the past weeks around Israel's attempts to change the status quo at the Al-Aqsa compound in occupied East Jerusalem. So in the wake of an attack by three Palestinian citizens of Israel on, the, on guards at the mosque compound, Israel introduced these metal detectors and cameras, uh, which violated the status quo. Uh, that was put uh, in place after the occupation began of the Palestinian territories began in 1967. And as you know, Jordan is the custodian of the holy site and the mosque authorities are responsible for security. And so that status quo that they are responsible for security was violated by Israel installing the cameras um, and the metal detectors. And the reason that Palestinians were so upset is that um, there have been constant attempts uh, by Israel to um, take over uh, or undermine uh, the, the very existence, uh, and by Israeli radicals to undermine the very existence of the Al-Aqsa compound. So after a prolonged period of civil resistance by Palestinian Jerusalemites who prayed in the streets in their thousands day in, day out, and who were joined by uh, several Christian Jerusalemites, Israel withdrew 
its security measures. This was celebrated as a victory by Palestinians, a victory entirely due to the people. It owed nothing to the Palestinian Authority or the Palestine Liberation Organization, which still claim leadership over the Palestinian people, um, even though, I mean, the PLO is still actually the official representative of the Palestinian people, um, but they haven't really exercised the kind of leadership that we need to see. However, that victory, which is still being celebrated, is, is already short-lived because the status quo continues to be violated. Just on Tuesday, um, uh, in a show of force, over a thousand uh, Jews visited the compound and, and several tried to pray there, um, which is a violation of the status quo. They're, they're allowed to visit, but not allowed to pray. Um, and uh, this, this is the largest number of vis visitors in one day um, in, in, in recent memory. And as I say, the problem is not that visitors come to the compound. The, the problem is that many Israeli Jewish radicals want to blow up the Aqsa compound and replace it with the third temple. And they have the support of several government figures. So this is not a figment of people's imagination. The, the compound is under threat and, and Palestinians know this and that's why they rose up in force to, to defend the compound. Um, there were also protests in Gaza uh, in besieged Gaza with, with very little electricity, very little clean water, with sewage flowing into the streets, there was an effort to protest Israel's actions at Al-Aqsa, um, and, and Israeli forces in fact killed a 16-year-old at the border just a few days ago and wounded several others. So Jerusalem, I think, will be the source of much more upheaval in the next several weeks uh, and months, and um, not... not uh, 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 because of, of the fact that the, uh, these uh, visits in, en masse continue to happen, the attempts at prayer continue to happen, and the change in the status quo continues to be challenged. But one thing the crisis in Jerusalem has done, it's shuffled the political cards on the scene. And I'm sure that uh, you've all been hearing all about uh, the prospects of a deal facilitated by the uh, Trump administration a uh, so-called outside-in approach, whereby Israel works with the Arab states to back a deal in which, in fact, the Palestinians get minimal rights, if any. Trump's emissary, uh, Jason Greenblatt, has negotiated a slight improvement on the ground, sort of longer opening hours on the border between the occupied Palestinian territories and Jordan, some building allowed in Area C. Um, but these are, this is a far cry from ending the occupation and moving towards a just peace. Uh, and what, what is the interest of the Arab states in, in dealing with Israel or doing a deal with Israel on this? Um, what's been the case is that the Gulf Arab states, especially Saudi Arabia, Emirates and Bahrain, because of their fears of Iran, they want to wrap up the Palestine problem, establish normal relations with Israel, um, and Egypt is part of this group that's pushing to just end the, end the conflict uh, at the expense of Palestinian rights. Abbas chose this moment of, of all this sort of uh, movement uh, uh, between the Arabs and Israel and Egypt, uh, the Gulf states of Israel and Egypt. Abbas chose that moment to impose his will on Hamas and try to put an end to the uh, split between Hamas and Fatah on uh, Fatah's own terms and to, to pressure Hamas to accept his terms for national unity. Abbas's pressure included cutting salaries of PA officials in Gaza. This has been going on for some weeks now and refusing to pay for fuel supplies to Gaza. So in effect, Abbas, uh, who, who claims leadership over the Palestinians, has made Israel's siege on Gaza even more draconian than it already was. And as you know, uh, Gaza was plunged, in, the Gaza Strip was plunged into darkness. And as I said earlier, the Mediterranean has been filled uh, with untreated sewage. Hamas, faced with this dire future, um, especially given the attack on its main sponsor, Qatar, by other Gulf states in Egypt, and that's a separate piece of the puzzle that Phyllis will, will talk about. Hamas faced no other options uh, for survival um, and was forced to turn to its former enemy, Mohammed Dahlan, who is backed by the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. 
Um, and uh, uh, all of this looked like it was going Israel's way because Israel very much wants to remove Gaza and its two million Palestinians from the whole Palestine equation, uh, leaving it to deal only with the, the uh, two and a half to three million Palestinians in the occupied territories. Um, and it wants, it, it's been hoping for years and years that Gaza would be sort of hived off onto Egypt. However, Israel has torpedoed, uh, in fact, the outside-in approach uh, with the Arabs, uh, with its response to the attack on the Aqsa Mosque compound. It will be very hard for Saudi Arabia, which, which likes to see itself as the main standard bearer of Islam and also a protector of holy places, um, to deal with Israel when Islam's third holiest place is under threat. Um, and also Israel's uh, uh, relations with Jordan have been hit by its response to the mosque attack and uh, Israel's subsequent response to an attack on the Israeli embassy in Amman. So the political cards have been reshuffled in that way. They're being reshuffled in other ways as well. Um, uh, Abbas may see now that his uh, approach to Hamas of, of trying to put to crush Hamas, uh, it's my way or the highway, uh, hasn't, hasn't gone very far, especially since they've allied with, or, or seeking an alliance with Dahlan, who is a main enemy of Abbas. So he's just met with the Hamas delegation this week to discuss the prospects of re reconciliation. And although Iran and Saudi Arabia have been on bitter terms for the last several years, there have been signs of warmth between them uh, at a recent meeting of the Organization of Islamic Conference, which was convened on Jerusalem. So the Jerusalem issue has really reshuffled the cards. And the question for us as human rights advocates is, what can we do against this very fluid, very um, turbulent background that's going on? We need to protect, for, for US activists especially, we need to protect and grow, continue to protect and grow the movement for Palestinian rights in the US and also around the world, despite all the attacks on it. And just some good news from Britain, where, as Phyllis said, I'm currently based. Uh, the Palestine Solidarity Campaign sued the government to pre, uh, for, uh, for preventing local councils from taking investment decisions uh, uh, that would not violate human rights, and won. So that's a big um, a positive step from across the Atlantic. Uh, we also need to constantly spotlight the human rights violations on the ground, especially in the prison that is Gaza, but also in the fragmented West Bank, which is really little better than a prison, and amongst the Palestinian citizens of Israel. And I would say, uh, uh, in closing, that we should not waste a lot of time on debating whether the ultimate political solution should be one state or two. We are very, very far from an ultimate political solution. What we should do now uh, is to build our sources of power. Not only are we very far from a political solution, the Palestinian leadership is far too weak to, to, to push for Palestinian rights and has worked itself into collaboration with Israel on the security sector, which means another layer of, uh, of oppression. So what we need to do is build up our source, sources of power, especially the reality that the international community, and in particular Europe, will not recognize, still will not recognize as legal any Israeli actions beyond the green line. And that is one of our sources of power to hold Israel accountable uh, at International Criminal Court and in other forums. And so I'll stop with that and I'll turn to Phyllis um, to, to take it from here. Thanks, Nadia. That was a great uh, sort of overview of what we're facing and particularly on what Palestinians are facing in the various areas where the divided Palestinian polity is located. I was going to bring us back to some of the regional considerations that are having a major impact right now on Palestinian lives in the most immediate sense, but also in the broader political sense. Uh, and that is particularly with the US focus on building the anti-Iran coalition across the Middle East. This is a very fundamental component of what the US is doing in these various machinations uh, in the region. I'm not sure I'm quite as optimistic as Nadia on the question of the, sig the significance of a warm hang handshake between Saudi and Iranian representatives at a recent meeting. 
the situation in Jerusalem may well have sparked that, and that's uh, an interesting development. But I think in general, the competition between Saudi Arabia and Iran for regional hegemony, mm-hmm. both at the level of sectarian hegemony, is it going to be Sunni or Shia Islam that emerges as the, uh, the most powerful sector within the Islamic world, but more immediately in the sense of every other kind of regional hegemony fight that goes on, they are quarreling over who's going to have more military power, more economic clout, more access to oil in the region, all the usual things that regional powers fight over when one or the other or both are trying to become hegemonic regional powers. And that's been going on for a very long time. In the immediate, there's a significant impact on the Palestinians over this fight because right now that fight between Iran and Saudi Arabia, where the U.S. has come in so definitively from the White House on the Saudi side, is having a significant impact by isolating other components in the region, particularly Qatar, uh, who are involved in this regional fight that's going on. I know people have been reading about the the fight between uh, Qatar on the one hand and the Saudi coalition made up of Saudi Arabia, the UAE, Egypt, Jordan, uh, basically the the Sunni uh, um, monarchies uh, around the Gulf that have the UAE, I think I mentioned, uh, that are coming sharply against Qatar, trying to isolate Qatar, coming out with these crazy kind of demands. Even the U.S. at one point said these are kind of crazy and they're a little bit extreme. And the Saudis pulled back, but the tension still remains. The significance of that for Palestinians is that Qatar was one of the few countries in the region that was actually providing some level of support, particularly to people in Gaza, in the form of money for rebuilding schools, for some basic medical and and food access, for some of the really basic survival needs of people in Gaza. The Qatar position has been, we will deal with anyone. So they had, for example, an Israeli trade mission, which no other Arab country other than uh, the two that have longstanding peace treaties with Israel, Jordan and Egypt. No other Arab country has had an Israeli office like that. Qatar did that, but they also were seen as supporting Gaza and therefore seen as supporting Hamas. So you have this impact on Palestinians when Qatar is under this kind of pressure from the US-backed Saudi coalition. One of the things that they can do is pull back somewhat from their support for Uh, for Gaza, and that has a terrible impact on the people of Gaza. There's also the the question in the the broader sense of the U.S. trying to build up this anti-Iran coalition, and we saw a great deal of this in the the Trump visit to the region when Trump made clear in Riyadh that he, he stands with Saudi Arabia and those who are on the Saudi side. Uh, meaning all of this is against Iran. Uh, So there's the possibility right now of new U.S. sanctions against Iran, a very dangerous move, something that just yesterday the Iranian government announced that in their view the new U.S. sanctions constitute a violation of the U.S.-Iran nuclear deal that also involved uh, uh, Germany, France, Britain, China, and Russia that they are reporting the U.S. to the committee that oversees potential violations because they believe that these new sanctions actually violate the the terms of the nuclear deal. This is a very dangerous ratcheting up what the U.S. is doing to what that deal has accomplished for the last two years, which is to make sure that the Iran nuclear program remains as peaceful as it has been so far and has lifted important, really crippling sanctions against the people of Iran. If the U.S. stops that, if it puts new sanctions on that send Iranians back to the really bad old days of pre-2015, that's going to set a very dangerous precedent for the possibility of further escalation and further militarization of the tension between the U.S. and Iran. And of course, the impact there will be devastating for, uh, for Palestinians. Mm-hmm. The Trump administration right now is somewhat less focused directly on Israel-Palestine than on the broader regional uh, uh, conflict. 
That involves the, the question of U.S. support for the Saudi war against Yemen, which has had these devastating uh, humanitarian effects. Of course, the U.S. involvement in the so-called war on uh, terror, meaning the war against ISIS, which in Iraq has recently led to the so-called liberation of the city of Mosul, a huge city, second largest city in Iraq, from ISIS control at the cost of thousands of lives based on the attacks by U.S. airstrikes uh, in the fight against ISIS in recent months. What's already underway in Syria in the city of Raqqa, the, the counterpart to Mosul, uh, where the U.S. airstrikes are already uh, having a, a, a hugely impacting uh, impact in, in, uh, in Syria. So the U.S. is very engaged militarily throughout the region, and the direct involvement in Israel-Palestine has taken somewhat of a back seat. That doesn't mean that nothing is underway, but it does mean that, for example, the extremist U.S. ambassador to Israel, uh, David Friedman, has been largely sidelined, largely marginalized through all this. And the efforts by, by uh, the son-in-law, Jared Kushner, and uh, Trump's special envoy, Greenblatt, Jason Greenblatt, has largely stalled. They've been going back and forth, but there doesn't seem to be any serious motion uh, on, their, on their part, because again, this is so far really focusing on Iran. Uh, and with the Saudis feeling empowered by that, feeling that they can you know, buy, in this case, $110 billion worth of new US weapons and promise to buy another $250 billion worth of US weapons over the next decade, uh, Qatar, of course, is also buying U.S. weapons to the tune of $12 billion. So the U.S. is, as usual, arming all sides uh, in this conflict. But the, the regional crisis, the regional escalation of military attacks is certainly having the most significant impact uh, on the lives of Yemenis, of Syrians, of uh, Iraqis, but also on the lives of Palestinians as the, the fallout from this regional set of escalations has the effect of cutting off support from Qatar, from Turkey, from other countries that are no longer willing to challenge the US or challenge Saudi Arabia by supporting the Palestinians. Uh, so in that, uh, in that context, the, the regional conditions are all going against the interests of, uh, of the Palestinians. Then when we get back to the question of what is the U.S. doing about all this, we, we heard from, from Nadia about this so-called outside-inside strategy. We should be clear, this is not a new idea. Although the years of Oslo were called the inside-out strategy, meaning the idea there was start with agreements between Israel and the Palestinians, and then the Arab states will have to come on board. Well, that one didn't work. But before Oslo, back in 1991, what was called the Madrid Conference that happened right as the end of the Cold War happened and the end of the Iraq War, the first Iraq War, that was exactly an outside-in strategy where the idea there was get all the Arab states together to talk to Israel, marginalize the Palestinians, don't even allow them to have their own delegation. They were relegated to being a kind of add-on to the Jordanian delegation and see what we can do. And that one didn't work either. So this is a, a strategy that has a long history of failure, uh, and there's no particular reason to think it's going to work any better now, particularly when the frame from Israel, the United States, uh, and, and Saudi Arabia and other Arab countries is the goal is to end the conflict, not to end apartheid, not to end occupation, but to end the conflict, meaning to impose some kind of stability that will prevent any further resistance. It's kind of the opposite of what Martin Luther King taught us when he said that the definition of peace is not simply the absence of conflict, but the presence of justice. This is saying precisely the opposite, that the end of conflict does not mean the presence of justice. It just means the end of conflict, defined largely as the end of Palestinian resistance. So that's what we are facing right now. In that context, there's a, a level of desperation here in the United States. We see the, the lashing out of APAC and other components of the, uh, the pro-Israel lobbies, particularly affecting supporters of BDS. We all know about the new law that has been uh, on the books that is being debated now in the Senate 
Uh, it's a dramatic new law, but interestingly, it was drafted. It was drafted directly by APAP. That's been pretty well established. What also is emerging is that a number of the 47 co-sponsors in the Senate from both parties, we should note, did not even read the thing before they agreed to be co-sponsors. And when the ACLU emerged as a major opponent of this bill, a number of members of the Senate started to say, well, maybe we should rethink this. And the first of them, Kristen Gillibrand from uh, New York, who is known for very strong pro-Israel positions, she has now said she's not any longer going to be a sponsor uh, of, the, of, this, uh, of this draconian new law. But just a note on the new law, we should be very clear that the fact that it was written by APAC also means that it was written in such broad-based language that nobody is really sure what it really means, how it would really be imposed. It's written to be linked to the old 30-year-old laws that prohibited U.S. corporations from abiding by the calls from the Arab League boycott against Israel that was a product of the oil uh, uh, crisis of 1973, 40 years, what am I saying? This had nothing to do with Palestine or Palestinians. And that boycott collapsed after three or four years, but it was never taken off the books, nor was the law prohibiting US corporations from supporting that boycott taken off the books. So those laws still exist, they don't mean anything, and they have nothing to do with BDS, because BDS is not a boycott called by a government. It's a call, as we all know, from Palestinian civil society, completely different animal. And so, so far, we haven't even figured out how they might use this law against supporters of BDS, except, and this is key, from the vantage point of intimidation. That's what it's aimed to do, to frighten people, to intimidate people into being afraid that if you support BDS, if you publicly support nonviolent pressure against Israel to end the Israeli violations of international law and human rights, that somehow you could face this criminal action of facing 20 years in, in federal prison. It's very scary. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind that we haven't, nobody's figured out yet how they could actually do that because there doesn't seem to be any actual link uh, to BDS. So the real goal seems to be primarily about, uh, uh, about intimidating. The Israelis are also clamping down on international supporters of BDS, international supporters of nonviolent protest, including, as we know, uh, in a recent delegation that was headed to Palestine and Israel, led by uh, IFPB, the Interfaith Peace Builders. It was an interfaith delegation, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish components. And those five people who included uh, the, the representatives the, the leader of each of those three religious groups, plus two additional JVP activists. So three Jews, one Muslim, one Christian, were the, the folks that were kept out at an airport in the US. In this case, it was Dulles Airport here in DC. That's a first. That's the first time that they ever got an international airline to agree to simply not allow people to board the flight overseas. They were kept out here in the US. So that's a new escalation that's underway. So, the, the good news here, and I want to end with this, is that the political discourse on this question, partly because the APAC lashing out has gotten so dramatic that lots of people, lots of organizations who had not traditionally taken much of a position on this, like the ACLU, taking such a strong position, they've always been strong supporting uh, the, the free speech rights. That's always been their strong suit but they've never been known to be so involved in a specific attack on the free speech of those supporting Palestinian rights as they were this time. That's had an, a huge impact. And that would not have happened without the years of work of movements like JVP, like the US campaign, like IMEU, like all the other components of the movement for Palestinian rights in this country that have transformed the public discourse in the press, in day-to-day -day discourse among people, among organizations. So this is where we have to keep up our work. This is where we have to keep up our work. The work has been amazing so far. We're in a very difficult, challenging moment. People in Palestine are facing enormous challenges on the ground and in the political reality. People throughout the region are looking to people in the US to change this US policy of militarism and war into a policy based on international law, 
equality for all, and human rights. Thank you all for joining us today on behalf of the JVP board. Thanks to Nadia. Thanks to the team who put this together. Thank you all. Thank you.